Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, leave a comment if you want to leave a comment. Check out our website. Please check out our website, www.legendsuperstitionmountains.com. Stuff on the bark notes. We'll probably get some of this stuff that I'm going to talk about and post it there as well. That being said and done, let's move along. We're coming to the end of October, and then we will be moving to the rendezvous, and then following up after the rendezvous, another Chasing Legends, but we'll get something in a report or something about the rendezvous afterwards, after the fact. Remember, this Friday, we will not be live because we will be at the rendezvous. And since it would probably buffer and we'd have a lot of problems out there, it's easier to throw up some archival and interview some sort of other thing, something special. Maybe we'll just talk about the rendezvous for five or ten minutes. But unfortunately, we will not be around. But hey, you're all welcome to come out and see us live in person. All right, that being said and done, where are we going to go? What spooky, awful, eerie story do we have to wrap up? Well, it's not exactly what you think. This is something we've touched base on before. And we talked at a bit of length. I think there's a, a long-form video almost of this. And it's about Adolf Ruth. And I thought it kind of fit with where we're going here. But the thing is, this isn't about Adolf Ruth like Erwin Ruth down in Mexico getting the maps. This is about Adolf going through the maps and figuring out where to go. This is an Adolf Ruth with Erwin out in Borrego. It isn't Erwin and Adolf and planning the trip to Arizona or Adolf's first trip or his second trip. It's not about his journey into the mountains. It's not about the search for this man went missing. No, this is later in the year and we're going to start in September, but this is kind of the kind of the final moments of all this happening. And it's interesting because what happens generally is you'll see a book, it'll have 10, 15, maybe 20 pages on Adolf Ruth. Yet yeah, there's tons of newspaper articles lot of interview material. There's so much material. In fact, the two biggest files I have in my file cabinet are eight of There's just so much information. So when a person writes a book, they condense it. They're trying to entertain you and they love to push the mystery of Adolf Ruth. And there just isn't a lot of mystery to it. Um, there is a little mystery to a few things, but not necessarily. Now we start in September of 1931, a gentleman named Erwin Ruth. Most people, anybody familiar with the story knows Erwin's name. And Erwin is contacted early in September by letter about a little archaeological expedition going in the superstitions that fall. And he's told kind of basically with the whole measure of what they're looking to do. They're hoping to have a dozen people at least involved. And it'll be headed up by Odd Halseth the City of Phoenix archaeologist. And they're planning this out. The group will be led by Jeff Adams and Brownie Holmes. And they figure they're going to these different sites. But since we'll be in the mountains, we're going to be keeping an eye out. Perhaps we'll find some sign of something of the whereabouts of your father. And they invite Irwin on this trip. And we don't have any response. Don't know if he did respond. I've never seen a letter where Irwin responds to this. But it's curious because shortly after this, um, Irwin, by October 15th, noted by the dates in them, has um, put together two manuscripts. One's called Fervent Romances in Mexico. And then the other is the story of the Mexican gold mine. And these kind of talk a little bit about Adolf Ruth and Irwin's time. Irwin kind of mm, fluffs himself out a bit. You think he's the hero? He's... He's a leading man. He's Cary Grant or George Clooney. And he puts these out. They're never published. Um, Superstition Mountain Museum used to sell copies of these. And it's very interesting because um, it, it's October 15th. This expedition hasn't gone out. We don't. I'm never quite sure what his attempt was with this because it's almost like it's not book length. 
Um, it's more like maybe magazine article, but too big for a magazine article. Not sure what his intentions really were with this, or if he was waiting for to see how things resolved and then write on it. It just never captured. Maybe nobody had any interest in it. But um, yeah, Irwin writes these. Now, you got to remember, as we go through this, there's two brothers, Earl and Irwin, both figure prominently into all this from the beginning. Earl is an attorney in Washington, D.C. Earl's kind of like, his name comes up, we have information from Earl, but he's kind of a little more, kind of like, not out there the end of the publicity. Now, Irwin is always a big deal, it's talking, he, like, he seems to be very extroverted and like the attention. And you could say it's because he was the better one at marketing the whole thing of getting people to look for his dad, who knows. But he does these manuscripts, which are never published, and, it, and it's kind of interesting. So, this expedition is supposed to go off, and they're starting to try to pull it together, because Odd Houseth wants to. And in the end, the basically the guides become Richie Wise and Brownie Holmes. Um, it involves Odd, Odd Houseth. And then they bring in a newspaper man, Mott, and then a newcomer, who's a photographer. And they're going along, and the plan is they're going to go to these archaeological sites and check stuff out. And they're going to take photographs and do stories on each one. And they even talk in the early versions of it. They might do, like, radio broadcasts from these places. But, basically, this is what the group that's put together. Richie Wise brings in four or five hounds. Um, the, the hounds are supposed to kind of, kind of watch things around them. And um, while they camp, and they spend, like, a week or so in the mountains... And they meet up at First Water Ranch. There's a lot of documentation about this because a newspaper story is being written about it. And so they get up at First Water, and then it's a little confusing because it sounds like they meet at First Water, but then their first camp is at First Water. So they probably set up camp the first night, which I think is December, not yeah, December 7th. And they get ready to start out, and there's photographs, and they were documenting it. And then Mott's writing about the trip. And they get to Garden Valley. And then there's this one problem with this entire trip. It rains. And it rains a lot. And it's cold. And it's windy. And anyone that's ever been on these trails and these trips, especially when it's raining heavy, the trails themselves become just like sucking mud. So you have to walk out on the side of the trail. So you can imagine how miserable they are. So they went in, they're setting their first camp, and it just rains, and they're finding some stuff, and they're talking about it, and the newspaper articles, which come out actually after the trip's over, obviously. But everything kind of like is like, man, this is miserable, this is miserable, this is miserable. They spend a number of days getting delayed, and then finally, it clears out, they're able to start moving again to set up their next camp. And uh, on the 11th of December, they're going down through Marsh Valley. Now, there's a trail that works down through there, and there was a lot of activity from the cattlemen. Um, it's the area where they also refer to as the Spanish racetrack is and a lot of stuff. We're coming through, and we're given the picture of the group. Bernie Holmes is the lead with the hounds. Um, I believe it's newcomers behind him, probably because he's taking pictures of the group and everything around. Then there's a pack train of three or four animals that are hauling all their equipment. And then comes Richie Wise, who's keeping the pack animals in line. And then Mott and Houseth bring up the back end. Houseth probably wasn't used to all this. Now, it's a little confusing because when you read it, Bernie Holmes says, Music, the dog that found Ruth's skull, breaks off to the right. Which means they're probably working north, far north of the trail. And what he was doing is trying to find solid, good, firm ground. Because you can imagine if you got five individuals on horseback and a few pack animals, how much that's churning up everything and just making a mess. So they were probably staying out of the trail because it had been raining every day and just pouring on them. He was probably working his way around trying to find the best way possible through on firm ground. But Holmes basically says, one of the hounds named Music breaks off, takes off across the desert. And he kind of looks and sees, because the animal obviously breaks away from the group. 
And then the dog stops a distance away and starts baying, which is in their tracking dogs for how, lion, mountain lions and other sources. So he's paying attention, starts to ride over that way. Richie Wise starts riding with him, and then the others have stopped and are now starting to drift that way. Holmes gets over, finds music standing over a skull under a Palo Verde tree. Um, Holmes kind of is looking at it, and then, of course, the newspapers pick up this line. Richie Wise and Brownie Holmes are like, oh my gosh, that must be Ruth's skull. Now, we can imagine that with everything that had happened, and they're out there, and they find a human skull just sitting on the ground, that's probably what they jump. Because, let's face it, on horseback, from 15, 20 yards, can you really identify that man's skull? No. But they jump to that conclusion, mention that, newspapers pick that up in a heartbeat. Um, then they dismount to go over and check it out, get the dog away. The next thing we have to wonder is, because I've seen two different accounts. One is, newcomer told Holmes, do not touch that, leave it be. Oh, okay. So Holmes goes over and stands there, and there's the iconic picture of Holmes standing there holding music and the skulls down there beside them. I've also heard that the first picture of the skull wasn't properly kind of sitting in frame and they wanted a better shot so they actually adjusted it just so it was looking down the cannon barrel and uh, when you look at it it's a really well framed picture for the moment so I'm sure there was a number of shots taken and that was probably the one it's for the newspapers for posterity him adjusting the skull doesn't make a difference but we have those two variations, which is always the problem. Anytime there's a variation, it's like, well, why? There's a mystery behind it. Well, it's just probably because he took a few pictures and was like, can you just adjust it a little? Because we got it on the pictures over for the sheriff or whoever. So they adjust it. At this point, Odd Houseth, in the article, and after that, quite some time, continues to say, it's an indigenous skull. This is probably Solano Hokum. It's very old. It's who knows where it came from. It's probably been here a long time or was dug up or something happened. Now, Holmes and Wise are not very sure. And they said it had a little bit of greenish to it and it smelled. And they thought it was somewhat more recent. So how stuff is dead set on this. They put it in a little burlap sack or something and they take it with them. And they end up at Charlie Boy. They get the Charlie boy, they hang it in a little tree nearby, and there's a photograph of them sitting around. They look miserable. It looks like things have not gone well, which they haven't. I think Holmes and Wise are the ones that, and even the newspaper guys, are starting to kind of pressure, say, hey, why don't we get back? We found the skull. Let's go see what it is. Houses, it's, we're here for this purpose, the archaeological digs or these things, because of vandalism. Part of this whole trip is about the vandalism that's happening at these sites and to document them. And he's like, no, we got this whole thing we're supposed to be doing. So they both are kind of like, ah, I don't know. Finally, Houseth doesn't win because the next day it's opening up and it's starting to flood and rain again. And they're like, you know what? We got to get out of here. So they start packing it out and they come back out of first one. And the skull's found on December 11th. They come out on the 12th. So they basically find the skull, go set camp, and then the 12th they start coming out. They, re they return into Phoenix, immediately take, go to the sheriff's, contact the sheriff, they found a skull, come into town, give it to them. One of the things that's overlooked so often, and I, I don't think I've ever really seen it mentioned in a book, is when they got to town, the first thing they do is they take the skull and have doctors and a dentist look at it. Now they don't have... Ruth's dental records or anything like that, but the two doctors, physicians, and the dentist all say agree one thing. It's an elderly white male. It's more probably something happened in the last six months to a year, and that's exactly what this is. Um, there's no mention of gunshots. There's no mention of anything else. Um, there is mention that the two holes in the skull are protruding inward and that there's a lot of scratches and looks like possibly gouged teeth marks on the skull. Well, how Seth still is going on about this indigenous thing, and that's well documented, and he takes the skull away from them and says, hey, I had the permit, it was my thing, I'm the city archaeologist, I'm taking possession of this because I need to have this checked out. 
because you can't have it because it could be older than you think and because of that I need it, it, it it's in my domain I I own this right now so he sends it off to Washington DC now he sends the skull off on the 13th now by this point they're starting to plan out the posse to go in and search for Ruth. So, and, and, and what's even more is that the 15th is when the first newspaper story runs. So the doctors have looked at it. The Skull's already left town traveling to Washington, D.C. when the newspapers start publishing the story. Story runs the 15th through the 22nd. So basically, by the time they've heard from Herdlicka and all this stuff goes down... The final story's coming out after the news has been released. But news traveled a lot different back then. But you got to remember, there's this weird overlap all the time in this story of one story to the other, and it's hard to put them in line. So basically, the group comes back. Sheriff McFadden of Maricopa County immediately is like, the, the skull's found in Maricopa County. i got to send someone out. Starts pulling people together to send someone out to search for that. But that's not what we're concerned about right here now. So they take the skull and it's sent off to Herdlicka. And the Smithsonian's contacted on this. Because it's an indigenous skull, according to Halseth. However, when Halseth writes Herdlicka, he kind of lets him know about the Ruth stuff and influences us a lot, saying this could be Ruth's skull. Well, hold it, buddy. <laughs> you just said it's definitely not. And your professional belief is this, but now there's an angle, perhaps. So Herdlicka gets it. He does his report, but it's kind of changed and altered several different times. And we have the different versions of it till there's a final report, which only remained with his papers. It never was officially filed anywhere. But Herdlicka does this, and then Halseth and Herdlicka are kind of going to the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian stance is... Well, it's not prehistoric. It's not a significant archaeological find. We have zero interest in this skull. This is this gentleman, Adolf Ruth, return the skull to his family and allow them to conduct what they can. It's not, it's not that under our view. We have nothing to do with this. Halseth and her liquor are a bit disappointed because they think there's an angle to this, which technically when you think today in the like National Enquirer type thing, it would be. Back then, they were standing by... It, it, it's something happened to this man, his family. Give the skull back to the family. We want, we need nothing to do with this. Because you could see, they, they could sense that this could be really bad publicity in the end. Especially since the whole idea of the skull's indigenous. And then it's, I think Halseth kind of knew in the beginning. But he wanted to grab some of that publicity. Which he got. Um, Earl Ruth, remember him, the son that's the attorney that's very quiet... Works with Herdlicka, sending him stereotypes, photographs, and stuff. So he can determine if it's Ruth's skull. He contacts Ruth's dentist. And he starts looking at the various findings of possibly, you know, is this Ruth's skull? Herdlicka believes it really is. He says there's enough determining factors here. And he's putting his report together, changing things at one point. His report says there's one inch holes. You see the skull, the holes are much larger than one inch, unless that's a very tiny, tiny skull. So, basically, you got this kind of, if you read a book, you're going to see a lot of this really isn't in there that there was other people looked at the skull before it was left. McFadden's on it immediately. He's trying to get um, Jeff Adams and Gus Barkley to go back out and look at the site. And so they're pulling that together, and her lick and them are still working at it. Now, the newspaper runs till the 22nd. And what's really kind of um, interesting on a lot of this is the skull basically, most of the stories break around the 19th. So the 16th is when House's letter go, or goes out to her licka. So by the time the newspaper story's breaking on the trip, they're still working out the details of what happened, what skull is this, but it's not in official. See, that's one of the big problems with the story. The official investigation, which is happening with these other individuals, and I can't remember the doctor's names and the dentist, but all that's happening in Arizona. None of that's really kind of, it's just barely making the print. Her look at because he mentions the gunshot, possible, maybe a gunshot wound, 
that all starts to kind of unravel and all because he became the national the the, the anthropologist archaeologist in Washington D.C. became the gunshot expert. So all this is unfolding. It's playing out in the papers, and that's they're kind of building this up. But the funny thing is, is we're sitting basically when the skull and the newspaper accounts and all this stuff's happening, kind of later in December. At that point, Jeff Adams and Barkley are already in the mountains. So we have a little bit of kind of a twist and turn in there because if you go date by date, you find they're out in the mountains right after the skull set off to Washington, D.C. Herdlicka and Halseth are kind of trying to work out what to do about the skull story. Herdlicka is talking to the newspapers. Earl Roof tells the newspapers, and his is very dry. Um, he doesn't really get into details other than what Herdlicka kind of told him and the possibilities. Um, Earl Ruth, pretty much after this, almost kind of like disappears. Um, we don't hear anything. There's no interviews with him. Where, with Irwin, obviously, there's a lot of talk. Glenn McGill, so many people. Clayworth, he wrote letters to Jim Bark and um, Sim Zeely. He was very, very involved in this. Definitely considered it a murder co conspiracy. We can't get in his head, but it could be because of the map situation. He really kind of got in-depth and involved and felt maybe some guilt, especially after Borrego and now this. So Irwin's like firmly entrenched in this. He was murdered and this and that. We must find the culprits and all that. There's no investigation and they're still trying to find a body. And in fact, as this comes out and then it just kind of plays out. Now, the story would have been more local except because Ruth was from Washington, D.C. and his sons were out there. The Washington Post picks up the stories, and then the story went more national. And when you look them up, there's a good series of the Arizona series of the trip, and a lot of documentation from the um, Arizona Republican and the Phoenix Gazette at the time, talking about dates and specific timelines of where this went out. So we have that, again, right in the book. You can't take 20, 30 pages just for that one piece. You're trying to take the whole story into 20, 30 pages. So we have the problem of the skull is found and the skull is brought in almost immediately. The others want to bring it in. They immediately say, we need to look and see if this has any tie to Adolf Ruth. We have doctors and people look at it. House that takes it out of their hands after that. But they obviously have taken photographs and documented it. And the skull goes away, but now they're determining, saying, okay, if there's a possibility. Heard lick, it confuses things. Because now the um, authorities, the sheriff and everybody at that point, have to address if there's a possibility. They can't rule it out completely 100%. So they say there is a possibility, but the sheriff's department, both Pinal and Maricopa, stand on the fact until we find his remains or any other evidence, we can't clearly say if there was any foul play. So that's the beginning of this whole story of the end of the story to some degree. That's all we got for you right now, but you're going to have to come back to hear all the rest of it. So until then, remember, I'm Wayne Tuttle, you're not, and this was Chasing Legends.